18th of October, just getting the briefing underway. Hope you all had a good evening. Just having a look, starting off with the Dow, <clears throat> because yesterday, I'd like to say it was a, a milestone, but when you're looking at the Dow and it comes to milestones, I don't really think yesterday's is really in the context of this phenomenal rise we've been seeing ever since, you guessed it, Trump came into becoming the US president, which is this area I've just highlighted here. This is just a pretty insane rally we've seen through there. And I thought I'd put some predefined lines here on the various thousand point increments. And this being then the sixth one thousandth kind of uh, barrier we're breaching at the moment with this 23,000 break we saw in the cash yesterday. Uh, and the futures just testing up at around these levels this morning. So, you know, just looking at the, obviously this monetary policy inspired lift that we saw post financial crisis and European sovereign crisis and the various realms of global phases of quantitative easing. But just looking at the trajectory of this rise, really, it's Donald. <laughs> and since he came, that's really uh, seen this absolutely um, one way directional market given this incredibly low level of volatility in the S&P in particular, uh, but directionally to the upside. So got to start with this. Uh, unfortunately, you probably can't hear the music, but if you just look at the graphic and kind of think Lion King, something along those lines, this is what Trump tweeted uh, yesterday. And obviously, he's drawing the quite stark comparison that 100% this is down to him because it obviously fits with his political agenda. But certainly uh, a day I'm sure we'll look back on. Uh, and who knows, 23,000. Well, let's have a guess in the chat room now. Do you think we're going to get to 24,000 in the Dow? Okay, got one yes. Anyone else? In the chat room we're at 23 we've gone from 18 to 23,000 okay Sam North probably the most convincing one quadruple billion trillion percent yes we're going to 24,000 um, yeah at this point obviously we're going through a, a quite an interesting phase in terms of policy setting because we're going through a, a process of global tightening. I mean, certainly in the case of the Western world, we've got a threat of the Bank of England moving interest rates uh, in just a few weeks' time. We've got the ECB also set at the end of this month to start unveiling about the way in which they want to taper their QE program. You've got the Fed already with a sequence of uh, interest rate hikes underway, and then they've commenced quantitative tightening. So. Definitely will be interesting going forward, but um, for the time being, I would say the trend is still your friend when it comes to equities and volatility being low. It's still more a case of identifying technically sound levels to kind of get along the market at this point. One of the big things, obviously, that might be relevant in the short to medium term, well, I guess the short term, would be who gets nominated as the replacement for Janet Yellen, I feel, could be... Uh, a short-term thing that equity markets might look at and it might liven up some of these tight kind of consolid consolidation that we've seen in the S&P might get broken if we say hypothetically had uh, Mr. Taylor or Mr. Walsh, the two which are defined to be the more hawkish members, then certainly you could see a brief bout of downside volatility uh, in the equity markets. The latter, Cohn, Yellen, uh, and Powell would probably contribute to just a continuation of what we have been seeing. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the, the US setup. Really, there's not a great deal of news flow for me to talk about this morning. Uh, one thing that you have had commence from overnight is the uh, party congress meeting in China, but ultimately not a, too much coming from this. Uh, 
Deutsche Bank wrote a pretty good summary, which I'll just quickly run over with you uh, to put this event, this National Congress meeting in China, a bit of context. So it's a week-long event, but kicks off a six-month process that continues with the Central Economic Working Conference in December and a National People's Congress in March next year. So Deutsche's uh, kind of China economist noting that the current event is more about politics than setting economic policies as the representatives will elect a group of leaders because basically they get to on the political bureau kind of retirement age if you like I think it's 67 and then they have to step aside and be replaced and so it's more uh, political if you like than it is economics uh, at this point so something which you should be aware of every morning when you come in just to see the kind of state of play and the sentiment overnight that might be derived from this event and some comments made from overnight session for your European Open but so far although there's been some quite interesting things said nothing really pivotal that's going to move uh, the financial markets for the Open for us this morning. So equity markets are pretty flat overall uh, if you're looking in the currency space it's a pretty similar story uh, elsewhere gold has drifted lower overnight uh, hasn't been much in the way of uh, a catalyst for the decline seen from the kind of late Asian session into this European morning. But the dollar has remained relatively firm from some of the gains that were made uh, yesterday. So really, I just wanted to have a little talk about sterling because yesterday was quite interesting for a number of different reasons. Obviously, there was quite a key level technically here we were looking at. Uh, that got broke. That was 132.49 in the futures. This being, if I just highlight a few areas of interest here, uh, the kind of 10th and 11th when it was resistance and then consequently as well acting as a decent level of support back at the beginning of the week. But we broke that. We initially ran up higher actually yesterday. If you remember, this was when the UK CPI data came out, was here. And that was as we often talk about some of the pre-positioning that occurs ahead of the number. Now one of the important things here is about when you're trying to trade economic data like the CPI number, obviously we kind of, uh, there's a lot of anticipation around the event, people await that, but then comes down the skill of discipline and when the number comes in at 3% and 2 spot 7 on the core, then these are exactly in line with expectations. And so what happens is because the market's being bid going into the figure on anticipation that potentially we might get an above consensus reading, that doesn't occur. You have a little bit of a pullback. But net-net, this data is in line with expectations. And so trying to get involved in that type of situation is particularly tricky because there isn't going to be an outright much of a definitive move. The market took back that pre-position movement ahead of the release, and that was it. Really, what was more interesting was the move that came thereafter, <clears throat> which was when we started to see some commentary from the Treasury Select Committee hearing. And we'll have a look at that in a second. But let's just have a look at the Bank of England, <clears throat> because this is a, a rather perplexed looking Mark Carney, because he's going to be faced with some real tough decisions in the coming weeks, him and his fellow MPC colleagues, because UK inflation back at 3% is a multi-year high in terms of the rate in which it's increasing. Now, start looking at a couple of charts. Obviously, inflation now is back to its highest since 2012. You can see here then now a full 1% off the Bank of England's target rate, of course, of 2%. And if inflation goes now 0.1 higher than it is at the moment, then Mr. Carney needs to dust off his stationary set and start... Uh, penning a letter to the Chancellor saying why he's failed to meet his mandate. So going further down though, this is the really critical graphic uh, and what's really the problem to just raising rates at this point is because of stagnant wage growth, meaning that higher inflation is hitting living standards. So looking at here, uh, the kind of pink line is the CPI reading which we had yesterday the CPI H this then takes in or includes a measure of owner occupiers housing costs but you can see here the measures are rising steadily and have been really ever since the EU referendum as kind of inflation pressures have ratcheted up 
The problem is, if you look at actual wage growth on an average basis, it's not doing anything. And in fact, comparative to pre-EU referendum and also uh, going back to 2015 and beyond, we, are, we haven't quite yet fully recovered in that respect. Uh, a lot of this might be to do with uh, the lack of clarity that corporations have about the prospects of the kind of two, three, four, five year horizon, given the clouded uncertainty surrounding what the future holds for uh, Britain's place within Europe and then globally. So it's this divergence which is, which is problematic at the moment. But taking us then through to the comments that we had yesterday, because these were particularly interesting. Now this is a graphic uh, which you may have seen me share on social media last night. Don't ask me why I'm, why I'm looking at these types of graphics at 11 p.m. Uh, like I said, if you want to stay on top of the news, I'm afraid it's a full-time job. And Twitter is your easiest, I'd say, medium for staying on top of uh, information that's curated, i.e. the people that you follow. If you're following people who put out quality content, then obviously you've got it on your mobile you can look at it at any point. So looking at this, this is the kind of the gauge of all of the Monetary Policy Committee members. So now there's nine in total on the Bank of England. And what we're looking at here are those that are more, I guess, in a sense, dovish and those more hawkish, i.e. dovish on the left, hawkish on the right. And then looking at the prospects of those who would be you would anticipate to back a hike going forward. Now, the very interesting thing yesterday was at this Treasury Select Committee hearing, these, these are regular events. So for Sir Dave Ramsden and Silvana Tenreiro, these were the introductions as per their appointments to join the MPC, but Mark Carney was also speaking. Now, Ramsden said, quote, I think there is some slack in the economy and noted he was not part of the majority of MPC members pushing for a rate increase. Hence the reason then he's seen as the status quo. I totally agree with that. It looks like from what he said yesterday, even inflation at 3%, he's, he's not convinced that the right decision, or well, it definitely didn't sound convincing that he would back that. Then Tenreiro noted that we're approaching a tipping point at which would be necessary to remove some of that stimulus, fine, so she's kind of indicating towards a hike. But she said her decision on rates in the coming months will depend on how the economy evolves. She also said as well the risk of mistiming a rate hike might mean a subsequent multiple rate cuts to come thereafter, which would be a big negative. So if you think about it, these two speakers, keep in mind that the market at the moment in fixed income is priced at 81% for a November interest rate hike from the Bank of England. So it's pretty much fully priced in. However, those two people alone were less than convincing that they're, they're going to back that decision. Then Mark Carney spoke. He noted that very limited amount of time between now and March 2019 and that the bank was preparing for the possibility of a hard Brexit without a transition period. And so obviously in that type of situation, the economy short term at least medium term would come under you would think an immense amount of pressure and as such likelihood you would want to have looser monetary conditions in that type of situation so actually despite a day where inflation moved back to its highest level since 2012 and we, we originally hit in the initial volatility on the numbers 133.12 the trade was actually cable weakness uh, this also came in the context as well of dollar strength, which was fairly persistent from the night before because of this circulation of a fifth candidate in the running for the Fed chairmanship being uh, John Taylor, which adopting his own economic kind of theory would be deemed as probably the most hawkish out of the five candidates in terms of where interest rates would go in the future. So dollar strength was already a, a kind of theme in the market. Then you had these kind of dovish comments from all three members and technically we broke that key level of 132.49 you can see we continue to remain under pressure we're sitting at the 132 handle right at this present point in time which you can see has acted as a, a bit of a line of support on prior occasions as well 
Uh, you can see here on the ninth there's some resistance, but on these other occasions here, uh, and kind of a consolidation around that S2 yesterday, which was the handle. So Brexit talks are also obviously ongoing in the background, and the, the basic gist of that is that both sides seemingly not willing to make a concession at this point, with the EU suggesting that they're reaching the limits of what can be achieved. And this, of course, is a, is a net negative then going into the EU summit, which commences on Thursday. So really, the things I've been monitoring here in cable now are, can this dollar remain firm? Because fundamentally, uh, the developments, as just discussed, are quite negative for the pound. Some dovish comments, albeit inflation was up and the market still priced for a hike, the current mood is that those speakers yesterday were more dovish. And so maybe a bit of pairing back of that kind of outright price for a November move. What I need now is a little bit of dollar strength. So uh, certainly keeping an eye on, on US economic data, any developments on any of the hawkish members getting a bit of a lead in the race for the Fed chair would definitely help the short-term direction to play the short in cable from that perspective. Obviously, interesting levels to be aware of would be, uh, I guess, the overnight high. Looks a little bit no man's land, though, going further back. So possibly any pull back up to uh, the pivot and then this 132.49 level from before could be interesting at that point. Um, if we start to run lower again, uh, even around here, 132.02, uh, as I said, is a, is a significant level. Downside targets, uh, that S... Uh, one level which would be the low from the 12th and then ultimately we're targeting the 131 handle and then below down to the low that was seen on the 6th of 130.48 if you were looking a slightly longer context that that would get that far in an intraday move without any fresh news breaking looking at one thing I did see yesterday I know you guys are all on Twitter so you probably saw it yourself but if you remember correctly there was this fellow, Piers Curran, the head of trading from Amplify. He put out this tweet on the September 22nd. This was after Theresa May's Florence speech. And you can see he made that call when price was at 136 and it went all the way down below 131. Not a bad shout at that point. Right on the money, you would say. So, interestingly, Piers has put out a new comment. This is his view from yesterday. He said the Bank of England, don't forget the Bank of England are priced 82%, I think it was, for an interest rate hike in November. Piers thinks that's not going to happen due to Brexit uncertainty escalating and a loss of growth momentum. And actually from here, he's looking at a target of 126. That's 126 by the end of November. So if we start looking at this cable chart and a bit of a longer dated time frame, my chart just populates in one second. Where does 126 take us? Um, well, looking at a daily continuation chart here. 126, you're looking right the way down to really these lows that were seen from uh, the summer period of earlier this year, if we were to get there. So just to give you a bit of context. All right, a few other things then, just to have a look at the calendar, just to get you up to speed. Switch over, you have more UK data coming out. And this actually is very important. I would say kind of just sits under how important the inflationary readings were. If you remember those two charts I've just shown you, the, one of the key areas is the fact that wages are not moving irrespective of the cost of goods going up and today we get average weekly earnings numbers so these are very important if these numbers are weak i.e. we get readings sub the consensus estimates obviously the bigger scaling out of the miss the more proportionate the impact will be on the pound 
but this definitely plays then into the context of adding further negative sentiment to the pound intraday I would say so in that respect these comments are or this data point we'll see at 9.30 is particularly important the final piece of the puzzle will come on Thursday because that's when we get the Bank of England or excuse me not the Bank of England but we get the release of the retail sales report which is the final kind of sweet spot if you like of measuring the UK economy because of it being such a service driven um, from a from a growth perspective so that wage data could offer you some opportunity later for the pound later then in the afternoon we've got US housing data building permits housing starts the month of September I would say I'd be listening out for these but I wouldn't be expecting too much in the way of it acting as a catalyst for potential market movement Rather, my attention is probably going to be on uh, the ECB speakers. So you've got ECB's Draghi. Uh, it's going to be speaking in the next 15 minutes. So I'm going to get off the mic pretty prompt uh, and let you cover that. And then we've got ECB's Pratt speaking. Uh, and you've got Fed's Dudley. ECB's Coer is also speaking later. Uh, so just be mindful of all of the comments coming out. Looking at the actual ECB media agenda... Mario Draghi is opening speech here at the ECB conference of structural reforms in the euro area. Um, so it's not explicitly on monetary policy in the economy, but I would definitely 100% be listening out for just in case he says something. And in that respect, look, keeping an eye on those European assets, euro, DAX, Bund, so on and so forth. Just going back then, we get the DOE all inventories. Uh, they'll come out later on this afternoon uh, regular time of 3.30 in fact let me just quickly jump onto Zero Hedge because they always publish the API infantry levels uh, the night before so one second if they've got it here if not then what I'll do is I'll just find the numbers and I'll post them back into your uh, your chat room okay here we go so these were the numbers Crude saw a drawdown of 7.13 million, the biggest draw in two months. Expectations were for a drawdown of just 3.2 million. Cushing was a draw of 151,000, not particularly large, but notable because it's the first draw in two months. Don't forget this data is weekly, and so the fact that it was their first drawdown in two months, well, actually, that's the first time in eight, nine readings, so that is significant. Gasoline, on the flip side, though, would be a bearish component because we had a build of 1.95 million, expectations were for 1.05, and then distillates was the biggest build in three months. So just having a quick look at crude, let's see where the price movement occurred last night when this came out, and I'm sure you guys have looked at the oil chart already this morning. Net, net, there's been very little sustained reaction. It's that candlestick here. Uh, in the center of what I've highlighted is what the move has been. So really, we're exactly where we were really when the numbers came out. So not too much of a read across. This is because crude and Cushing, you could argue, are bullish factors, but it's negated by the bearishness of the other figures underlying the actual report itself. So once again, you'll be looking out on the calendar for the DOE's numbers coming out later and you'll use those numbers as your reference point for how the market might react to that. Crude oil at the moment, I would say it's not looking particularly interesting at these current levels. Uh, I guess not unless we get to the upper bound, that R1 level pretty much lines up with the high that we're seeing, the weekly high printed on Monday afternoon at around the kind of regular, what would have been the, the historical pit open timings. On the downside, though, if you were looking to get long the market, then maybe around the, the S1 level, the previous highs from last week on 11th of 12th, uh, and you've got some of that price action from yesterday with S1 just sitting below at 60, so 51, 68, 60. Okay, going to leave it at that. As I said, Draghi is speaking uh, and is coming up shortly. Uh, I've just had a comment in the chat, so just quickly to finish off, someone's asked me to just have a quick look at the Japanese yen. So the yen, you can see this line I've just had marked up anyway from yesterday. Uh, I was looking at, I guess this was Monday's high, 
which we've breached already this morning. So we're just above that. Uh, upside from here, you've got the high from the 11th, 1, 12, 30 ahead of then the respective R2. Now this is one of the things that I do in the morning is when I'm trying to not only monitor the news and technical levels of significance, I, I do often look at the likes of, if I look at these two charts that I'm just showing here now, you've got yen, dollar yen is moving higher, gold is moving lower. So obviously from a risk appetite point of view, this would be classified as you know, moderate risk on uh, environment. So i.e. the yen weakening and as to is gold. And this obviously comes in the context of the Dow hitting 23,000 yesterday. You know, there hasn't really been a great deal going on, but these types of levels start to add a bit of positivity to market sentiment. If I just flick over to the futures now, looking at the Dow, we are right there testing that level at the moment. Uh, although the cash did break it yesterday. Okay, guys, have a good day. 9.30, next big event coming up. That'll be the UK wage data, so heads up for that. Okay, good luck.